The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Let's start. Any questions? We've been gradually building up thermodynamics. Culminating in what I call the most important fundamental relation, which was DE is uh, TDS plus JI DXI. And essentially, we said that this was some statement of conservation of energy where there is a heat component that goes into the system, and there is a work component. And actually, we ended up breaking the work component into a mechanical part and a chemical part, which we wrote as mu alpha dn alpha. Now, I guess if I don't write the sums, the summation convention is assumed. Now, this gave us an idea of uh, what a thermodynamic system is in the sense of how many coordinates do we need in order to place the system in equilibrium somewhere in some coordinate space. And we said that we can just count the number of variables that we have on this side. And indeed, for the case of energy, the natural set of variables would be s, x, and n. And given some uh, place in the coordinate system that is s, x, and n, you could uh, find a point that corresponds to that thermodynamic equilibrium state. Now, having gotten this fundamental relation, we can manipulate and write it in different fashion. And in particular, for example, we can write ds is uh, dE by dt minus uh, ji dxi over t minus mu alpha dn alpha over t. So you could, in principle, express everything rather than in terms of entropy, which for some circumstances may not be the right variable, in terms of the energy content of the system and the variables that you need in order to make uh, work type of changes on the system. And we saw that other versions of it is possible. So for example, we could rearrange rather than looking at E, we could look at E minus TS the quantity that we call f. And then df would look very much like the original equation. Rather than tds, we would get minus s dt. And clearly, for this quantity f, the natural variables are t, x, and n. And there were other types of these functions that we construct. So basically, at this stage, we have a formula that tells us how to navigate our way in the space of things that are in equilibrium. And by taking various derivatives of equilibrium uh, functions with respect to each other, we can express other ones. And via this methodology, we can relate many different things to each other and have mathematical relations between physical observables. So following up on that, we then ask, what are some other mathematical forms that we can look at? And one set of forms followed from extensivity. And we saw that if we were under circumstances, such that we were to multiply all of the extensive variables 
by some factor, two, three, whatever, and the energy content would increase by that same factor, then we could, in fact, integrate the equation and drop the d's and write it in this fashion, ts jx plus mu n regarding this as kind of vector. And importantly, that told us that the intensive variables were not independent of each other. And you had the relationship that you had S D T plus uh, J I uh, X I D J I plus N alpha D mu alpha is zero. And uh, last time I did one calculation using this gibbs duhem relation that I repeat. And that was uh, for a gas isotherm. Isotherm corresponds to dt equals to 0. And the analog of hydrostatic work for a gas was minus p for j. So this becomes minus v dp plus n d mu, if you have one component, equals to 0. And we said that this gives us the relationship that along an isotherm, so for a fixed t, d mu by dt is v over n. So I'll come back to that shortly. Okay. Towards the end of last lecture, I mentioned that we can get a number of other so-called Maxwell relations by noting that mixed second derivatives are independent of the order of taking derivatives. So that if you have some df of x and y, written as df by dx at constant y dx plus df by dy at constant x dy, then the order of the second derivatives, which would be obtained by taking either a derivative of the first term with respect to y or the second term with respect to x, doesn't matter which order. OK, so let's uh, start with our uh, initial equation. And for simplicity, let's think of uh, cases where we have a fixed number of particles so that we can write dE as uh, TdS <coughs> plus Ji dxi. Okay. So this looks like this df that I wrote before for you. And I can identify temperature as uh, dE by dS at constant x. And each one of the forces Ji as dE by dxi at constant s and all of the j's that are not equal to i kept fixed. And then since the second derivative is irrespective of order, I can form the second derivative with respect to the combination S, X, I in two different fashion. I can either take a derivative over here. I already have derivative with respect to S giving me T. So I will get DT by dx i essentially at constant uh, uh, S, or I can take the derivative of this object. I already have the x derivative, so I take the s derivative. So I have dji with respect to s at constant x. Okay. So this is an example 
of the Maxwell relation. And just to remind you, we can always invert these derivatives. So I can invert this and say that actually, if I had wondered how the entropy changes as a function of a force, such as pressure, at constant x, it would be related to how the corresponding displacement to the force changes as a function of temperature. So you would have a relationship between some observables, such as uh, uh, how the length of a wire changes if you change temperature rapidly, and how the entropy would change as a function of uh, pressure or corresponding force, whatever it may be. Now, what I would like to remind you is that the best way to sort of derive these relationships is to reconstruct what kind of second derivative or mixed derivative you want to have to give you the right result. So for example, say somebody told me that I want to calculate something similar, ds by dj, let's say at constant temperature. How do I calculate that? Okay. A nice way to calculate that is if I somehow manipulate so that S appears as a first derivative. Now, S does not appear as a first derivative here, but certainly appears as a first derivative here. So who said that I have to take E as a function of state? I can look at the second derivative of F. So if I look at F, which is E minus TS, and actually I don't even need to know what the name of this entity is, whether it's F, G, et cetera. All I know is that it will convert this to minus S dt, the, T, the TS that I don't want, so that S appears now as a first derivative. Okay, now I want to take a derivative of S with respect to a J. Uh, if I just stop here, the next term that I would have is Ji dxi. And the natural way that I would construct a second derivative would give me ds with respect to xi. But I want ds with respect to Ji. So I say, OK. I'll do this function instead. And as I said, I don't really care what the name of these functions is. This will get converted to xi dj. Okay? Now I can say, well, there is this first derivative, d of minus s with respect to ji at constant t is the same thing as d of minus xi with respect to t at constant j. Okay. So I can get rid of the minus sign if I want, and I have the answer that I want. So it is dxi by dt at constant uh, j, uh, at constant uh, yeah, t, j. Okay, And you can go and construct anything else that you like also. Let me, for example, try to construct uh, this entity. We already calculated, right? So let's see what can I say about d mu by dp at constant temperature. And I want to calculate that via a uh, uh, Maxwell relation. All right. So what do I know? I know that dE is TDS minus PDB. OK, good. Uh, oh, I want to have mu in the play. So now I have to add mu dN. OK. Now that's good because I have mu as a first derivative. I have it over here. 
but I have p as a first derivative, whereas I want p to appear as the work element, something like dp. So what I will do is I will make this d of e plus pv. And this converts this to plus uh, vdp uh, plus mu dn. That's fine. Except that when I do things now, I would have calculated things at constant s. And I want to calculate things at constant t. That's not really important. I do a minus st. This becomes minus sdt. And then I have a function of state. I don't care what it's called. That has the right format for me to identify that d mu by dp at constant n and t along an isotherm of a fixed number of particles is the same thing as dv by dn at constant p and t. Okay? So that's my Maxwell relation. So why didn't I get this result? Did I make a mistake? Louder. Yes, this is valid for extensive system. I used extensivity in derivation of this. And here, I never used extensivity. But if I have a system that I tell you it's pressure and temperature, how is its volume related to the number of particles? I have a box in this room. I tell you pressure and temperature, they're fixed. If I make the box twice as big, number of particles volume will go twice as big. So if I were to apply extensivity, I would have to conclude that this is the same thing as V over N, and I would be in agreement with what I had before. OK? Any questions? Yes? OK, actually, constraint of constant P and T is important because we said that uh, there is a kind of Gibbs-Duhem relation. And the Gibbs-Duhem relation tells me, for the case of the gas, that uh, SDT minus uh, VDP uh, plus N d mu is uh, 0. And that constraint is the one that tells me that once you have set p and t, which are the two variables that I have specified here, you also know mu. That is, you know all the intensive quantities. So once you set p and t, the constraints over there, you really, the only thing that you don't know is how big the system is. And that's what the condition that I used over here. That it is only, so let me reemphasize it this way. I will write dv by dn is the same thing as v over n, only if I have p and t here. If I had here p and s, for example, I wouldn't be able to use this. Okay. Now, I was going to sort of build this equation to say that look at the elements of this. This part we got from the first law. The temperature we got from the zeroth law. And this we got from the second law, which is correct, but it leaves out something, which is that uh, what the second law had was things going some particular direction. 
and in particular, uh, we had that for certain changes that I won't repeat, uh, the change in entropy had to be positive. So when you are in equilibrium, you have this relationship between equilibrium state functions. But in fact, the second law of thermodynamic tells you a little bit more than that. And so the next item that we are going to look at is what are the consequences of having underlying this equality between functions of state, some kind of an inequality about certain things being possible and certain things not being possible. And that relates to stability conditions. And I find it easier to, again, introduce to you these uh, stability conditions by thinking of a mechanical analog. So let's imagine that you have uh, some kind of a uh, spring. <coughs> and that this spring has some kind of a potential energy that I will call phi as a function of the extension x. And uh, let's say that it's some nonlinear function such as this. There's no reason why we should use a Hookian spring, but something like this. Okay. Now, we also discussed last time what happens if I were to pull on this with some force j. Okay, so I pull on this. As a result, presumably it will no longer be sitting at x, because what I need to do is to minimize something else, the function that we called h, which was the potential energy of the spring plus the entity that was exerting the force. So if I were to make it uh, in the vertical direction, you can imagine this as being the potential energy of the mass that was pulling on the spring. So what that means is that in the presence of uh, uh, j, what I need to do is to find the x that minimizes this expression. Okay. Once, essentially, the kinetic energy has uh, disappeared and my, uh, my spring stops oscillating and goes to a particular value. And mathematically, that corresponds to sort of subtracting a linear function from this. Actually, what will it look like? Let's not make this go flat, but go up in some linear fashion so that at least I can draw something like this. OK? So what I need to do is to minimize this. OK, so I find that uh, for a given j, I have to solve d phi dx equals to j. Okay. But especially if you have a spring that has a kind of potential that I drew for you, you sort of start increasing the, so basically what it says is that you end up at a place where the slope is equal to uh, the derivative of the potential function. What happens if you start increasing the slope? If it is a nonlinear type of thing, at some point you can see it's impossible. Essentially, it's like a very flat noodle. You pull, it, pull on it too much, and then it starts to expand forever. So essentially, this thing that we are looking for a minimum ultimately also means that you need to have a condition on the second derivative. d2 phi by dx squared better be uh, positive. Actually, I have to take d2 phi uh, d2h by dx squared. I took one derivative to identify where the location of uh, the best solution is. 
if I take a second derivative, this became essentially the j. j is a constant. It only depends on the potential energy. So it says, independent of the force that you apply, you know that if the shape of the potential energy is given, the only places that are accessible are the kind of places where you take the second derivative and the second derivative has a particular sign. So this portion of the curve is in principle physically accessible. The portion that corresponds to essentially changing the curvature and going the other way, there is no way, there is no force that you can put that would be able to access those kinds of displacements. Okay? So there is this convexity condition. This was for one variable. Now suppose you have multiple variables, x2, x3, etc. So you will have a potential energy as a function of many variables. And the condition that you have is that the second derivative of the potential with respect to all variables, which forms, and if there are n variables, this would be an n by n matrix. This matrix is positive definite. What that means is that if you think of this as defining for you the bottom of a potential, in whatever direction you go, this would describe the change of potential for you. The first order change, you already set to 0 because of the force j. The second order change better be positive. Okay. So this is the condition that you would have for stability quite generally mechanically. And again, this kind of came from the fact that if you were to exert a force, you would change the energy by something like j delta x, which is certainly the same thing that we have here. This is just a one component that I have been focusing on. And so ultimately, I'm going to try to generalize that to this form. But one thing that I don't quite li ri like in this form is that I'm focusing too much on uh, the displacement. So this is written appropriately is in this form. And we have seen over here that whether or not I express things in terms of uh, the displacement or uh, in terms of entropy, temperature, conjugate forces, etc. These are all equivalent ways of describing the equilibrium system. So I'm going to do a slight manipulation of this to make that symmetry between forces and displacements apparent. So the generalization of this expression that we have over here is that once I know the potential energy, the force in this monthly component space is dF by dxi. So in this multi-component space, I have some j, and there is a corresponding uh, x. They are related by this. Now, if I were to make a change in j, there will be a change in the position of the equilibrium. And I can get that by doing a corresponding change in the derivative. The corresponding change in the derivative is the second derivative of phi with respect to uh, xi xj delta xj sum over j. So what I'm saying is that this is a condition that relates the position to the forces. If I make a slight change in the force, there will be a corresponding slight change in the position. And the changes in the position and the force given by this equilibrium condition are related by this formula. Okay. Now you can see that that sum is already present here. 
So I can rewrite the expression that is over here using that formula as delta xi delta ji sum over i better be positive. Okay. So this expression is slightly different and better way of writing essentially the same convexity condition, stability condition, but in a manner that treats the displacements and the uh, forces equivalently. And I'm going to apply that to this and say that in general, there will be more ways of manipulating the energy of a thermodynamic system and that having the system reach to equilibrium requires the generalization of this as delta T delta S plus sum over I delta J I delta X I plus sum over alpha delta mu alpha delta N alpha to be positive. You may say I didn't really derive this for you because I started from mechanical uh, equilibrium and stability condition and generalized to the thermodynamic one. But really, if you go back and use this condition and do manipulations that are comparable to this, you will come up with exactly this. Uh, instability condition, and I have that in the notes. It is somewhat more mathematically complicated than this because the derivatives involve additional factors of 1 over t, and you have to do a slightly more work, but you will ultimately come with the same expression. Okay? Now you say, why is that of any use? It is possible that you've already seen a particular use of this expression. Uh, let's look at the case of a gas. One component, you would say that the condition that we have is that delta T delta S minus delta P delta V plus delta mu delta N has to be positive. Okay. Let's even be simpler, look at the case where delta T is 0, delta N equals to 0, which means that I have a fixed amount of gas at a particular temperature. So I could have, for example, a box in this room, which is in equilibrium at the same temperature as the temperature of the room, but its volume I'm allowed to adjust so that its pressure changes. So in that process, at a particular temperature, I will be uh, finding a particular curve in the pressure volume space. And the reason that I through this particular way is because I have the condition that minus dp dv better be positive. So that if I have p as a function of v, then I know that dp is uh, dp by dv delta v, and if the product dp dv is positive, then this derivative dp by dv has to be negative. This has to be a decreasing function. And another way of saying that is that the compressibility kappa t, which is minus 1 over v, the inverse of this dv by dp at constant uh, uh, t has to be positive. Okay, so this is a curve where dp by dv 
is negative. Fine, you say well, nothing surprising about that. Well, it turns out that if you cool the gas, the shape of this isotherm can change. It can get distorted. And there is a critical isotherm at which you see a condition such as this, where there is a point where the curve comes with zero slope. So you say that for that particular critical isotherm occurring at TC, if I were to make this expansion, the first term in this expansion is 0. Okay. You say, OK, let's continue and write down the second term, 1 half d 2 p by dv squared at constant uh, t times delta v squared. Now, the problem is that if I multiply this by delta v, which would have made this into delta v squared and then this into delta v cubed, I have a problem because delta v can be both positive or negative. I can go one direction or the other direction. And a term that is a cubic can change sign, can sometimes be positive, can sometimes be negative, depending on the sign of that. And that is disallowed by this condition. <coughs> so that would say that if an analytical expression for the expansion exists, the second derivative has to be 0. And then you would have to go to the next term, d cubed p dv cubed. And then delta v, you would normally write delta v cubed. But then I've multiplied by delta v on the other side, would have delta v to the fourth. Delta v to the fourth, you would say, is definitely positive then I can get things done by having to make sure that the third derivative is negative. And you say, OK, exactly what have you done here? What you have done here is you've drawn a curve that locally looks like a cubic with the appropriate sign. And so that's certainly true that if you have an isotherm where the compressibility diverges, you have a condition on second derivatives. And you probably have used this for calculating critical point of Van der Waals and other gases. And we will do that ourselves. But it's actually not the right way to go about. Because when you go and look at things experimentally with sufficient detail, you find that these curves at this point are not analytic. They don't admit a Taylor expansion. So while this condition is correct, that the shape should be something like this, it is neither a cubic nor a fifth power, but some kind of a non-analytic curve. OK? Could you, could you repeat that last statement again? That statement, in order to fully understand and appreciate, you have to come to next term where we talk about phase transitions. But the statement is that the shape of the function in the vicinity of something like this is delta p is proportional to delta v to some power gamma that is neither 3 nor 5 or nor an integer. It is some, some number that experimentally has been determined to be of the order of, I don't know, 4.7. And why it is 4.7? You have to do a lot of interesting field theory to understand. And hopefully, you'll come next semester, and I'll explain it. So your point is that, that the gamma is not this fourth power. Gamma is not. So the, the statement is, in order for me to write this curve as something delta v plus some other thing delta v squared plus some other thing delta v cubed, which we do all the time, there is an inherent assumption that an analytical expansion is possible around this point. Whereas if I gave you a function y that is x to the 5 thirds around x of 0, you cannot write a Taylor series for it. OK? So.
Essentially, this uh, stability condition tells you a lot of things about signs of response functions. In the case of mechanical cases, it, it is really that if you have a spring, you better have a, a force constant that is positive so that when you pull on it, the change in displacement has the, same, the right sign. It wants to be contracted. And similarly here, you are essentially compressing the gas. There is a, a thermal analog of uh, that sign, which uh, is worth uh, uh, making sure we know. Uh, let's look at the case where we have a fixed number of particles. And uh, then what we would have is that our DE is uh, uh, TDS plus uh, ji dxi. I am free to choose any set of uh, variables. The interesting set of variables, well, OK, so then stability implies that delta t delta s plus delta ji delta xi with the sum over i is positive. Now I can take a look at this expression and choose any set of uh, variables to express these changes in terms of. Uh, so I'm going to choose for my variables temperature and xi. You see, in this, the way that I've written it here, S, T, J, X appear completely equivalently. I could have chosen to express things in terms of T, T, uh, S and J, T and J, uh, S and uh, X, but I choose to cho uh, use T and X. Okay. All right, so what does that mean? It means that I write my delta S in terms of the S by DT at constant x dt plus ds by dx i at constant t and other xj not equal to i delta xi. All right. I also need an expression for delta ji here. And so my delta ji would be dji by dt at constant x delta t plus dji with respect to xj at constant t, an appropriate set of j's, uh, delta x i, uh, delta x j. Okay, sum over j implicit here. I substitute these delta S and delta J in the general form of the stability condition to get constraints applicable to combinations involving delta T and delta X. So I have to multiply delta S with delta T. I have to multiply delta JI with delta XI here. Yes. So here, um, J is not equal to I, and which one is J? Uh, partial S. Okay. OK. So let's say that I have S that is a function of, uh, uh, OK. I have x1 and x2, right? So here I would have derivatives ds by dx1 times delta x1. I would have derivatives ds by dx2 times delta x2. In both cases, t is kept fixed. In this case, additionally, x2 is kept fixed. In this case, additionally, x1 is kept oh. fixed. That's all. OK? So let's do that multiplication. We multiply a delta t here, and we get ds by dt 
at constant x delta t squared, we get here a term which is delta t delta xi. multiplying ds by dxi at constant t and the others that I don't bother to write. But I note that I will get another term that is delta xi delta t from the second term whose coefficient is dji by dt at constant x. And I group those two terms together. And finally, we have the last term here, which is delta xi delta xj dji by dxj constant. And the constraint for all of these stability conditions that I have written, I have to be in the minimum of a potential. Any deviation that I make better lead to an increase in this combination, which is kind of equivalent to being at the minimum of some kind of potential energy. If you do some manipulations, it is also equivalent to being at the maximum of some entropy function. Okay. Now let's uh, look at that manipulation a little bit. Now I happen to know that this form will simplify a little bit. And that's why I chose this combination of variables. And the simplification that will happen is that this entity is 0. So let me show you why that entity is 0. And uh, that relies on one of these uh, Maxwell relationships that I had. So let's find the Maxwell relation that is applicable to ds by dxi at constant t, which is what I have over here. OK, let's again start with dE being tds plus ji dxi. I'm at fixed number of particles. I don't need to write the other term, UDN. Uh, unfortunately, here S is not a first derivative. So what I will do is I will look at E minus TS. That's going to turn this into minus SDT. Uh, good. JI DXI is exactly what I want, because this will tell me something about the derivative in this fashion, ds by dxi at constant t is equal to what? It's taking the things in this fashion, which is dji by dt at constant x. Good. So I can see that the sum total of these two terms is 0. And that's exactly what I have here. So this is 0 by Maxwell relation. So having set that to 0, I have two terms. One of them is this entity that goes with delta t squared. And the other is this entity, sum over i and j, delta xi, delta xj, dji, dxj, constant t. 
and this for any choice of delta x's and delta t's, for any choice, it better be positive. Okay? So in particular, given this nice form that I have over here, I can certainly choose all of the delta x's to be 0. That is, I do things at constant uh, displacement. And then what I have is that the whole thing is proportional to delta t squared and some coefficient. And so that coefficient better be positive. Okay. So entropy should always be an increasing function of temperature at constant displacement. And the consequence of that is that heat capacity is measured at constant uh, displacement. So this is the heat capacity. Cx, the general definition is you put some amount of heat into the system at constant displacement. So I have to specify the procedure by which heat is supplied to the system and see how much uh, this uh, temperature changes. I can, in principle, do this sufficiently slowly, so I can measure precisely the changes in temperature infinitesimally. And then I can use the relationship between dq and reversible heat, so ds at constant x dt. And ds by dt at constant x is precisely the entity uh, that we have looked at. To be positive. Okay. So, in the same way that a spring is stable, if you pull on it, its extension should increase a little bit. And so the uh, coefficient that relates the change in displacement corresponding to the change in force has to be positive for stability. Uh, heat capacities must, be po uh, must have this uh, positivity in the sense that if you uh, add heat to a system, its temperature should go up. If it went the other way, it would actually also violate the second law of thermodynamics. Yes? I'm a bit confused about the J equation that we used. So the initial equation that we start has only index yeah. of I, but uh, where does J come from? This equation. Which equation? Up here? <coughs> so index J is just a dummy variable. Uh, we could you? OK, so fine. So let's start from top here. And part of the confusion is that I'm not really consistent. Whenever I write an index that is repeated, uh, there is a so-called summation convention that you may have seen in quantum mechanics and other courses, which says that the index that is repeated twice is summed over. So when I write a i b i using the summation convention, what I mean is sum over all possible values of i a i b i. Okay? So what I meant here is that there may be multiple ways of doing work on the system. So there could be pressure, there could be spring, there could be magnetic work, and uh, if I do mechanical work on the system, the change in energy is the sum total of all different ways to do mechanical works, plus the heat that is supplied to the system. So that's statement number one. Okay. Now, I did something else here, which is that when I take a derivative of a function that depends on multiple variables, so f depends on x1, x2, x3, xn, Okay. 
then if I look at the change in this, it is any one of these variables can change by an amount that is dxi. And if the second variable changes, there is a corresponding contribution, which is df with respect to the second variable. And I have to add all of these things together. Okay? So if I'm, again, inconsistent, this is really what I mean, that when you do a change in a function of multiple variables, you would write it as dxi, df by dxi. If we use the summation convention, I have to really sum over all possibilities. Now suppose I took one of these things, like df by dx3. Okay, So it's one of the derivatives here. And I took another derivative, or I looked at the change in this function. This function depends also on variables x1 through xn. So I have to look at the sum over all changes of, with respect to xj of df by dx3 delta xj. Right? So you can see that automatically I have kind of assumed some of these things as I write things through rapidly. And uh, if it is not clear, you have to spend a little bit of time writing things uh, uh, more in detail. Because it's, after all, kind of simple algebra. Yes, did I make another mistake? <laughs> yes. Uh, not mistake, just yes. Uh, so when you were talking about the mechanical instability, you have this yes. nonlinear spring. You yes. start to limit at some point, it just increases. If it is a nonlinear spring, yes, yes. that's right. Uh, can you provide an example of thermodynamic system which, upon some like threshold action upon it, becomes unstable? OK, uh, I think I more or less had that example. Let's try to develop it a little bit further. So I said that typically, if I look at the pressure volume isotherms of a gas, it looks something like this. Okay, And I told you that there is actually some kind of a critical isotherm that looks something like this. And you may ask, well, what do things look below that for lower temperatures? And again, you probably know this, is that this is the temperature below which you have a transition to uh, liquid gas coexistence. And so the isotherms would look like that. Now, it turns out that while these are true equilibrium things, you would have to wait uh, sufficiently long so that the system explores these isotherms, it is also possible in certain <coughs> systems to do things a little bit more rapidly. And then when you go below, you will see a kind of a remnant of that isotherm, which kind of looks like this. Okay? So that isotherm would have portions of it that don't satisfy these conditions of uh, second law, uh, these conditions of uh, stability. And the reason that you still get some remnant of it, not quite the entire thing, you get actually some portion here, some portion here, is because you do things very rapidly and the system does not have time to explore the entire equilibrium. So that's one example that I can think of where some remnant of something that is like that uh, nonlinear uh, uh, noodle takes place. But even the nonlinear noodle, you cannot really see in equilibrium, right? You can only see it when you are pulling it, and you can see that it is being extended. There is no equilibrium that you can see that has that. So if I want to 
find an analog of that nonlinear noodle showing instability, I'd better find some near equilibrium condition. And this is the near equilibrium condition that I can think of. Okay. And uh, there are a number of cases. I mean, essentially, you probably heard hysteresis in magnets and things like that. And by definition, hysteresis means that for the same set of conditions, you see multiple different states. So not all of, not both of them can be, or multiple of them can be in equilibrium. And over some sufficient time scale, you would go from one behavior to another behavior. But if you explore the vicinity of the curves that correspond to these hysteretic behavior, you would see the signatures of these kinds of uh, thermodynamic instabilities. Yes? No? OK. Uh, there was one other part of this that maybe I will write a little bit in more detail given the questions that were asked. Uh, that is here I looked at this general condition for the case where the delta x's were 0. Let's look at the same thing for the case where delta t equals to 0. Because then I have the condition that dji by the xj delta xi delta xj should be positive. And this was done at constant t. And to be more explicit, there is a sum over i and j in here. Okay. So if I'm doing things at constant temperature, I really have the analog of the instability condition that I had here. Right? It is the same thing as this one. And if you think about this in a little bit more detail, let's say I have uh, something like uh, gas. Well, no, let's say we have two, two ways of doing work on the system. I have dj1 by dx1. I have dj2 by dx2. I have dj1 by dx2. I have dj2 by dx1. Essentially, this object, there are four of them. And those four I can put into something like this. And the statement that I have written is that this 2 by 2 matrix, if it acts on the displacement delta x1, delta x2 on the right, and then gets contracted on the left by the same vector delta x1, delta x2, for any choice of the vector delta x1, delta x2, this better be positive. This is for 2. But in general, this expression is going to be valid for any number. Okay. Now, what are the constraints that the matrix must satisfy so that irrespective of the choice of these displacements, you will get a positive result? Mathematically, that's called a positive definite matrix. So one of the conditions that is certainly immediately obvious is that if I choose the case where delta x2 is 0, then the diagonal term that corresponds to that entity better be positive. So a matrix is positive definite if for every one of the diagonal elements I have this condition. Okay. So this is actually something that we already saw. In the case of the gas, this would be something like minus dp by dv at constant temperature be positive. This is the 
nature of this isotherms always going one way that I was drawing. And but yes, you're not summing over alpha now, are you? Or are you? Yes, I'm not, and I don't know how to write. <laughs> Let's call it delta <laughs> j one j one. X one. Okay, so all diagonal elements must be positive, but that's not enough. So I can write a matrix that has only positive elements along the diagonal, but off-diagonal elements such that the combination will give you negative uh, uh, values of this com uh, combination for appropriate choices of delta x1 and delta x2. The thing that you really need is that all eigenvalues must be positive. <coughs> it is not that easy to write down mathematically in general what that means in terms of uh, uh, multiple response functions. So that's why this form of writing is much more compact and effective. It basically says no matter what combination of elements you choose, uh, you are at the bottom of the potential. You should not be able to uh, go away from it. OK? So the second statement is necessary in sufficient conditions? This statement <coughs> is necessary but not sufficient. This statement is equivalent to the meaning of what is a positive definite matrix. It is sufficient. Yes? Is there any physical interpretation to diagonalizing that matrix? Uh, the matrix? It depends on the kind of deformations that you make. Like if I was really thinking about a gas where I allow some exchange with the surface or something else so that <coughs> delta n is not equal to 0, the general form of this matrix in the case where I have pressure volume would be something like this. I would have minus dp by dv. I would have d mu by dn. I would have uh, uh, dp by dn. I would have d mu by dv. And I would have to make sure that this matrix is positive definite. So I know certainly that the compressibility by itself has to be positive. d mu by dn also has to be positive. But if I allow changes both in volume and the number of particles, then because of these off-diagonal terms, I have additional constraints. So for appropriate changes, it is sufficient to look at the diagonal terms. But for the entire set of possible transformations, it's not. Yes. So, so technically, if, if you look at uh, different ways to do the work on the system, so uh, in this case, change volume, change number of particles. Yes. Uh, if, if you think this um, forces have different dimensions, and it, diagonalization of this matrix corresponds to like, inventing some new ways of acting on the system, which are like linear combination, yes. so always like change volume a little. And, Change, Change the number of particles, yes. And um, that's, I guess, pretty weird manipulations in, in terms of like how to physically explain what is that in all the matrix. OK, I mean, one, there is a question of dimensions and there is a question of amount. So maybe what you are worried about is that uh, if I make one of them volume and the other temper, uh, pressure, one is extensive, one is intensive, and the response functions would have to carry something that is proportional to size. But then there are other conditions, let's say, where all of the variables are intensive, and then it's moving around in the space that is characterized, let's say, by pressure and chemical potential from one point to another point. And uh, uh, there is some generalized response that you would have depending on which direction you go to. So essentially, I could certainly uh, characterize various thermodynamic functions in this space, p mu. And what I know is that I cannot write any function 
in this two parameter space that would be consistent with the thermodynamic principles of stability. I have to have some kind of a, uh, uh, convexity. So certainly what typically, let's say, again, going back to my favorite example here, what people do and what we will do later on is we specify that you have some particular, let's say, pressure and volume of an interacting gas, and there is no way that we can calculate the thermodynamic properties of that system uh, exactly. We try to construct a free energy as a function of these variables, okay? And that free energy will be approximate based on some ideas, and then we will see that that free energy that I construct in some places will violate the conditions of stability. And then I know that that free energy that I constructed, let's say on the assumption that the box that I have is uniformly covered by some material, that assumption is violated. And maybe what has happened is that part of the volume is a liquid and part of the volume is gas. So we will do precisely that exercise later on. We will choose a pair of variables. We will try to uh, construct a free energy functional. We make the assumption that the box is uniformly occupied with the gas at some density. Based on that, we estimate its energy, entropy, etc. We construct a free energy functional. And then we will see that that free energy functional violates the uh, compressibility condition at some point. So we know that, oh, we made a mistake. The assumption that it is uniformly occupying this box is wrong. So all right, any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the limits of its applicability, because it's, I mean, we think of it as being very general, like mm -hmm. in many different systems. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I want to think of, like I wonder, for example, if we had two bar magnets, mm -hmm. and we had the North Pole close to the South Pole of the other one, and I thought of the magnetic field in between, is it conceivable to think of that as a thermodynamic system? Uh, you can think of the magnet as a thermodynamic system. Uh, and you can certainly look at two of them, including the, mag the electromagnetic field that surrounds them. And there would be some conditions, like if you were to jiggle these things with respect to each other, and you would maintain the entire thing in a box that uh, prevented the escape of electromagnetic waves or heat to the outside, <coughs> that the, eventually this jiggling of the two magnets will lead to their coming to equilibrium, but at a higher temperature, OK? So this is what I'm saying. So imagine that you have, let's for simplicity, think of, again, one big magnet that you don't move, and one small magnet here that uh, you externally jiggle around. And then you remove the source of work. You wait for a while. And then you find that after a while, this thing comes to an equilibrium. You ask, where did that kinetic energy go to, <coughs> right? You had some kinetic energy that you had set into this, and the kinetic energy disappeared. And I assume that there are conditions that the kinetic energy could not have escaped from this box. So the only thing that could have happened is that that kinetic energy heated up the air of the box, the magnet, or whatever you have. So thermodynamics is applicable in that sense to your system. Now, if you ask me, is it applicable to having a single electron spin that is sort of polarized because of the magnetic field and some condition that I set it to oscillate, then it's not applicable. <coughs> Because then I know some quantum mechanical rules that govern this. There may be, in some circumstances, some conservation law that says this will oscillate forever. If it doesn't oscillate forever, there's presumably a transition matrix that says it will emit a particular photon of a particular energy. 
And I have to ask what happened to that photon. So what we will see later on is that thermodynamics is very powerful, but it's not a fundamental theory in the sense that the quantum mechanics that governs this spin is. And the reason that this works for the case of the magnet is because the magnet has billions of spins in it. Billions and billions of <laughs> spins or whatever. And so it is the law of large number that ultimately allows you to uh, translate the, uh, the rules of motion into a well-defined theory that is consistent with thermodynamics. Uh, I know that my, my question seemed off topic, but the reason why I asked about this particular system is because I would think that it doesn't comply, it doesn't have a positive compressibility. Like if, if you pull the two magnets apart very slowly, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the force um, pulling them together decreases instead of increasing like with the rubber band. Uh, OK, I mean, it may be that you have to add additional agents in order to make the whole system work. So it may be that the picture that I had in mind was that you have the magnet that is being pushed up and down. And I really do put a number of springs that make sure there exists an equilibrium position. If there is no mechanical equilibrium position, then the story is not whether or not uh, thermodynamic applies. It's a question of whether or not there is an equilibrium. right? So in order for me to talk about uh, thermodynamics, I need to know that there is an eventual equilibrium. And that's why I actually recast the answer to your question, eventually getting rid of the kinetic energy of this so that I have a system that is in equilibrium. If there are things that are not in equilibrium, all bets are off. There's thermodynamics is the science of things that are in equilibrium. OK? Other questions? All right, so there is only one minor part of uh, our description, rapid survey of thermodynamics that is left. And that's the third law of thermodynamics. And uh, that has to do something with the uh, behavior of things as you go towards the limit of the zero of thermodynamic temperature. And uh, I think we will spend maybe 10, 15 minutes next lecture talking about the third law of thermodynamics. And probably from my perspective, that is enough time with respect to what the time we spend on the other laws of thermodynamics. Because as I will emphasize to you also, the third law of thermodynamics is in some sense less valid than the others. It's not it's certainly correct and it is valid. It is just that its validity rests on other things than what I was emphasizing right now, which is the large number of degrees of freedom. You could have a large number of degrees of freedom and a world that is governed by classical laws of physics, and the third law of thermodynamic would be violated. So it is a condition that we live in a world that is governed by quantum mechanics that tells us about the third law, as we will discuss next time. Okay. <coughs>